Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Frequently Asked Questions 1. Can I exercise the physical body and still attain Nibbana? Yes, you can. The path to Nibbana involves training of the mind, not training of the body. To sustain this life, you need the body and the mind to reside together. Without the body, you have no ability to train the mind. So, you should exercise the physical body if you like and maintain its health in prudent ways. There is less effort for the body and the mind when the body is healthy. An unwholesome body will put strain on the body's systems and also the mind. Proper hygiene, proper food supply, proper sleep, physical fitness, and medical checkups are helpful to ensure you are maintaining the body's physical health. The mind can also become attached to having excessive hygiene, proper food supply, physical fitness, and extensive concern about poor health causing discontentedness, so it's important that you maintain your health without attachment. For example, if you plan to work out each day at 8 a.m. and it is your permanent schedule, it will be impossible for you to maintain the schedule permanently because of impermanence. It will be impossible to maintain a fixed, steady, or permanent schedule. Just because you missed a workout at 8 a.m. can the mind still be content. Missing a workout does not give you permission to be grumpy, upset, or angry to those around you. You also should not show arrogance that you are a superior athlete who looks down on all those who choose not to implement a fitness plan. You should also not rush through daily activities just to get to your workout. Take things at a calm, steady pace and work out when you have the time and ability if you choose. You will find that having regular physical activity of some type will improve the condition of the physical body and clarity of mind. 2. Is medicine and medical procedures for the body an attachment? Determining if something is or is not an attachment is based on how the mind relates to the person, object, or situation. If there is a mental longing with a strong eagerness, that is an attachment. There are many health conditions that can be improved by medications. Pain relief medicine is helpful in certain situations. In life, you may experience headaches and other pains in the body. This is normal, and pain relief medication can be helpful to temporarily relieve various pains in the body. Once you attain Nibbana, the body and the mind will be tranquil, light, and peaceful. If you are experiencing pain in the body, it is challenging to train the mind. Temporarily relieving the body of its pain through medication can be helpful, but you must ensure that you do not become dependent or addicted to medications that influence the mind. Discuss medications and the use of them with your doctors, ensuring you have selected doctors and medical professionals who have eliminated craving for wealth and are dedicated to providing respectful, beneficial patient care with no other motivations. Medications that are prescribed for mental health can be an attachment as described in a previous chapter. There are no medications that will permanently eliminate emotions, feelings, past traumas, or expectations you place on yourself that cause a discontent mind. Mental health medications will suppress the emotions and feelings, but they will not eliminate them and are only temporary solutions. The only permanent solution to attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy is Nibbana. 3. Do I need to give up all my possessions, occupation, and relationships to attain Nibbana? Absolutely not. 
While living a simple life can provide a lot of peace, the type of life you create for yourself and your existence is your personal choice. These teachings are not about eliminating possessions, occupations, and relationships, but rather purification and training of the mind. You need to eliminate how the mind relates to possessions, occupations, and relationships, etc., having these things while practicing non-attachment. The mind needs to eliminate the ten fetters, or taints, of the mind, not possessions, occupations, and relationships, while cultivating other beneficial qualities of the mind. You can have possessions, an occupation, and relationships while practicing non-attachment to attain Nibbana. 4. What is our purpose in life? What is the purpose of our human existence? This is a common question some ask of themselves, and we sometimes ask of spiritual teachers. Various answers to these questions have been provided by various spiritual teachers around the world. Let's explore this question and the nature of this question arising in the mind. The human mind contains the human ego. These types of questions are asked from the human ego. It is our ego that has a craving or desire to have importance and a purpose in this life. The ego craves for there to be a special purpose or higher calling for human existence on this planet. The human ego is always looking for significance, purpose, and importance so the question of what is our purpose in life, could surely arise in the mind. The short answer is, there is no purpose to life. There is nothing here, and there is no point or significance in life. This could be considered a pessimistic view, but let's examine it more closely. If humans completely vanish from the earth in the snap of a finger, would there be grieving or sadness? Who would grieve or be sad? Would the monkeys, whales, or birds grieve that humans have vanished? Would the world seas have dismay that humans have vanished? Would the sun and moon still rise and set if humans instantaneously disappeared? If you answer these questions honestly, you would come to the conclusion that the monkeys, whales, nor birds would grieve the vanishing of humanity. In fact, they would probably be pleased and see humanity's disappearance as beneficial. The world sees would not have dismay if humans vanished and again would probably benefit enormously from our disappearance. The sun and moon would still rise and set based on the same cycles that have always existed and human disappearance would have no effect or change to these celestial cycles. Who is going to even remember you and your existence on this planet a few hundred or a few thousand years from now? If you answer this question honestly, no one will remember you or care that you existed. So, who would truly grieve, have sadness or dismay at the disappearance of all of humanity? Only humans, right? We have such a strong craving to exist that we continue to exist on this planet and oftentimes search for meaning or purpose in life. This outward searching and seeking importance is just the human ego seeking significance. In this way, we crave possessions, wealth, relationships, job titles, or self-image, all products of the mind seeking importance. Similarly, it is the human ego that holds, grasps, and clings to the idea that humanity must and shall always continue. In the world as it existed during prehistoric times with massive creatures roaming the earth, I suspect that the human ego was practically non-existent. If we lived during those times and ventured out from our cave, we knew that there were massive creatures that were much more powerful and significant in the world than us humans. Prehistoric humans, most likely, were very aware of their presence and the presence of creatures that were much more dominant and powerful than humans. These more dominant creatures could eliminate a human's life practically instantaneously with their power and might. I suspect the prehistoric human mind understood humans are not powerful and that other creatures ruled this planet. It is only in modern society that humans have developed an ego that is unbalanced and unchecked. We have created technology and advances in transportation, energy, weaponry, and other fields that have made us the supreme being on this planet. If a lion or other beast killed a human, we would most likely seek out the beast and kill it, with our advances in intelligence and weaponry to track and kill the beast. 
the modern human ego would find it necessary to exert our dominance over any beast that exists today that killed a human and got away with it. This allows the modern human ego to retain our false sense or craving for dominance and control of the world around us. Conversely, if a human was killed by another creature during prehistoric times, and there were many creatures to do the killing at that time, humans would have just accepted it and moved on, knowing that humans are not the dominant force on this planet. There would not be an attempt to kill all the creatures by prehistoric humans because that objective would be impossible. Throughout history, humans have evolved significant intelligence and ability to dominate or control the world around us, and through that ability to exert our control or will, the human ego has evolved and is firmly rooted in the human mind. But if we strip away the modern human ego to eliminate seeking importance and significance, refocusing on the prehistoric mind, what we would most likely find is that prehistoric human beings had no such desire or interest to understand their significance or importance on this planet, because all they cared about is existing. They only cared about survival. They depended on the land and the resources it provided. I propose the only interest among prehistoric human beings was to exist and coexist peacefully among all the creatures that resided here on this planet. If they did not seek a peaceful coexistence with all creatures on the planet and live in harmony with Earth's resources, humans would not have existed. They hunted and gathered to provide food. They created shelters and clothing. They looked for ways to create a better and more comfortable existence with each other. They did not seek importance or significance of why they existed. They just sought a better existence to live and stay alive. It is only in modern civilizations that we have created jobs, possessions, titles, hobbies, sporting activities, and other activities that we pursue to pacify or occupy our time in this existence to create some sort of importance or purpose the human ego can latch onto to feel important. As various teachers have been asked these same questions over the years, various answers have been provided. The mind of seekers and teachers have an overwhelming desire for an answer and to provide an answer. As a teacher, it does not make me feel more important, significant, or wiser to provide an answer to the questions of what is our purpose in life or what is the purpose of our existence. Can a teacher, and thus the student, just be content with the answer, there is no purpose, we just exist? It is the human mind and the human ego that is constantly trying to create purpose for this existence that we continue to exist and continue to add more and more obligations and relevance to our existence. We are the dominant and controlling creature on this planet, so the ego expects and craves the answer that there must be some sort of significance or importance to our existence. I can be content to share there is no purpose for human existence and there is no purpose for humans on this earth. I have no interest to please an ego to sound wiser if I provide a definitive answer to this question. Can the mind be content with the answer? There is no purpose for human existence, and there is no purpose for humans on this earth. Or do you still have a craving or desire for a purpose? Does your ego still crave and desire an answer to what is your purpose in this life? Is the ego still seeking importance and significance? If so, here is the answer I will provide you. Your purpose is to attain nibbana and enlightenment, which includes dissolving of the ego, so that once you dissolve the ego, you will see that there is no purpose to the human existence. Upon attaining nibbana, you will have escaped the cycle of rebirth, and thus you will not be reborn into a new existence of nothing or no purpose. Sustain your life through the daily activities that are required to sustain life, attempting to do no harm to other beings or the planet. Seek Nibbana in this life, dissolve the ego, and realize there is nothing that exists here for you in this world, and we do not need to continue human existence. 
Elimination of the craving for importance and significance in this life is to eliminate and dissolve the ego that craves an answer to this question. You have made yourself constantly busy and occupied with tasks, objectives, goals, and responsibilities that are pleasing to the mind and to the ego. The mind, and thus the ego, feels important and significant. However, there is no purpose for humanity to exist, and until we realize that, the mind, and thus the ego, has us on a never-ending pursuit to feel important and significant, and thus we will continue to have craving for existence. If there is craving at the time of death, we will be reborn through the cycle of rebirth, eventually returning to a new human life of constant pursuit of importance and significance. Craving is the fuel that leads to rebirth. To eliminate rebirth, one needs to extinguish craving. It is not until we fully dissolve the ego, along with other realizations on this path, that we attain Nibbana so that we will not return to a new existence with a purpose of nothing. 5. What significance can I apply to dreams? The mind can produce various thoughts and experiences, including dreams. There are always questions about how to interpret dreams. The person who experiences the dreams can oftentimes look to others for the meaning and purpose of a dream to help guide them in life. This practice can oftentimes be misleading at best. The potential subject matter of dreams and how they are interpreted are countless. For every dream one experiences, there can be any multitude of explanations that one may gather from others. Who is to say what is accurate or inaccurate with the various interpretations and methods used to acquire such information? When you experience a dream, it is best to not be attached to its meaning or needing an explanation. Whatever is produced during sleep and what that means does not make a dream a reality. It is best to stay focused on reality and truth in life experiences learning and practicing these teachings. You may notice as you near Nibbana and attain Nibbana that dreams become less frequent or are actually eliminated 100%. While there are some who put a lot of belief and superstition into dreams and dream interpretation, it is best that as you remember dreams to just move past it, remaining unattached to acquiring the meaning of a dream. Consider a dream in the past while focusing on what you need to do in the present moment to continue your progress on this path. Being attached to the past or past experiences can only burden the mind and leave one craving answers to past experiences when one of the goals of these teachings are to bring the mind into the present moment without concern of what has happened in the past or what may happen in the future. 6. Can I be Buddhist without believing in rebirth? Yes, one does not need to understand, believe, or know the truth regarding rebirth to learn and practice the teachings of Gautama Buddha. Let's explore this topic further to provide you additional information for a deeper understanding. Considering a person Buddhist or not is only a label. Labels of being a Buddhist or not will not determine whether you are or are not learning and practicing these teachings closely. There is nothing to determine whether you are or are not a Buddhist. In fact, Gautama Buddha himself was not a Buddhist. This label did not exist during his lifetime. The teachings and practices Gautama Buddha shared were offered to humanity as a life practice that would improve the condition of the mind through awakening it to true reality, enlightenment, and nibbana. There are many people who have advanced in their practice to the point of observing past lives. It is through these observations that people, including Gautama Buddha, know that rebirth is truth. You may or may not ever observe past lives as part of your pursuit to attaining Nibbana. The good news is that you do not need to observe past lives in order to attain Nibbana. What transpired in the past is in the past and has no impact on whether you attain Nibbana in this very life. Part of this good news is that your gamma in your previous lives was wholesome enough that you were able to obtain the human state for this rebirth, and now you have an opportunity to attain Nibbana in this very life. What happened in the past or may happen in the future is not important to attain Nibbana in this very life. 
the mind needs to reside in the present moment, learning and practicing the teachings that lead to good wholesome decisions to attain Nibbana. Additionally, there are no teachings in this practice that one should merely believe. Belief does not allow you to attain the wisdom that would ultimately liberate the mind. It is only when you learn the teachings, putting them into practice, that you will be able to independently verify the truth in the teachings that will ultimately liberate the mind to attain Nibbana. You should never believe anything in these teachings, but instead work to learn and practice the teachings so that you can independently verify the truth for yourself. This will ensure you are gaining wisdom to liberate the mind. For more details on how rare it is for one to obtain the human state, see Gautama Buddha's simile, By Chance That One Obtains the Human State, available in this book. 7. What is reincarnation and rebirth? Are they the same thing? Reincarnation and rebirth are different. They are not the same. Reincarnation, the re-emerging of a soul in a new body. Reincarnation typically relates to a new existence from a soul, spirit, or entity of a previously existing being. The new existence is seen as being the same as the previous being, just in a new body. Reincarnation requires a permanent soul or entity that emerges repeatedly in new existences. Gautama Buddha did not share this as part of his teachings. The concept of reincarnation conflicts with Gautama Buddha's teachings on non-self, and thus, was not taught by Gautama Buddha. In Gautama Buddha's 45 years of teaching, his teachings never contained any contradictions. Reincarnation is dependent on a permanent soul or spirit transcending multiple existences. Gautama Buddha left the teaching concerning a soul as undeclared, having never taught the concept of a permanent soul or a permanent self that transcends multiple existences. Rebirth a new being that has come into existence through the cycle of rebirth based on a previous being's craving in Kama. Gautama Buddha taught rebirth through the cycle of rebirth. Rebirth is a new existence of a new being that has been reborn based on a previous being's craving. Craving is the fuel that causes rebirth. If there is craving at the time of death, there will be rebirth into a new existence. If Nibbana has been attained, i.e., all craving fully extinguished, there will be no rebirth. The new being may or may not have residual memories of previous existences and its new consciousness that may be recalled over time during the new being's life. Rebirth is not based on a permanent soul or spirit of any kind, but instead is caused by the craving of the previous being which produces a new birth into a new existence. Each new birth is a new existence or new life. In reality, this should be shared and discussed as the cycle of new existence because there is nothing that is actually being reborn. Kama of the previous being will determine the destination and life situation of the new being. Kama of the previous being determines in which realm the new being will be reborn, hell, afflicted spirits, animal, human, or the heavenly realm. Kama from the previous being also determines the quality of life of the new being. For example, the family and life situation, poverty versus wealth, one is born into the appearance of the new being, and the condition of the new being's body and mind are all determined based on the gamma of the previous being. If the previous being generated significant amounts of wholesome gamma to be reborn into the human realm, the new being is reborn into a favorable destination within a wealthy family, beautiful appearance, and or with a healthy body and mind. If the previous being generated significant amounts of unwholesome gamma, the new being is reborn into an unfavorable destination of the lower realms, hell, afflicted spirits, or animal realms, or If reborn into the human realm, the being will be reborn into difficult circumstances in the new existence based on the previous being's gamma. Difficult circumstances that result from the previous being's gamma would include what realm the new being is reborn, what part of the world, the type of family, the amount of wealth, ability to acquire necessities to sustain life, appearance, and 
the health of the body and the mind. Craving determines if there is rebirth, while gamma determines in what realm, what situation, and the condition of the new being upon rebirth. 8. What does it mean to take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and is there a ceremony to do this? Refuge. Shelter or protection from danger or distress. A place that provides shelter or protection. Something in which one has recourse in difficulty. Buddha. A being who has attained Nibbana, enlightenment, on their own, without the assistance of teachers to independently discover teachings that leads to their own enlightenment, with the ability to share their independently discovered teachings that leads others to enlightenment. The last Buddha currently known to the world existed 2,500 years ago, who I refer to as Master Teacher Gautama Buddha or Gautama Buddha. You will see other ways people refer to him. Dhamma The teachings of Gautama Buddha based on the natural laws of existence that lead to awakening of the mind, Nibbana, enlightenment. Sangha the entire community of practitioners to include ordained practitioners and anyone who has attained one of the four stages of enlightenment. This includes household practitioners. These are the teachers who can guide others to attain enlightenment through the teachings of Gautama Buddha. When we say, take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we are saying that one's mind can be protected through having confidence in the Buddha, through learning the Dhamma, and through seeking guidance from the Sangha. One would need to take refuge in all three, not just one. This is also referred to as the triple gem or the triple jewel. When one learns and practices these teachings with guidance from teachers, the mind can reside permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. The mind is unshakable because on this path you will know the truth and have deep wisdom. The mind will be unshakable meaning nothing and no one can ever cause the mind to be angry, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, or have even the slightest dislike or discontentedness. The mind will be protected from these and all other discontent feelings like boredom, loneliness, guilt, shame, fear, shyness, etc. Absolutely nothing will ever negatively affect the mind. If one seeks refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, The mind will be permanently protected through your own learning and practice to attain Nibbana, enlightenment, as you are guided by teachers of the Sangha. The mind will be unshakable. People throughout time have come up with ceremonies that say it is an acknowledgement of taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. However, this ceremony was not taught by Gautama Buddha and is only something that people developed along the way. There is no benefit to a ceremony. A ceremony does not have the power to change anything about the mind. It is only through learning and practicing the teachings that the mind can develop and improve its condition. One of the aspects of the mind Gautama Buddha taught to eliminate in order to attain Nibbana is wrong grasp of behavior and observances, elimination of rites, rituals, and ceremonies to achieve Nibbana. One needs to eliminate this fetter from their practice to even attain the first stage of Nibbana. This is one of the ten fetters. All ten fetters need to be eliminated to attain Nibbana. Taking refuge to Gautama Buddha would be to learn and practice the teachings. In this way, the more you learn and practice, the more and more protected the mind will become. A ceremony cannot do that for you. It is only through your own dedication and commitment to learning and practice that will allow one to have protection of the mind, taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. All human beings can take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. All human beings should take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. This is the only way for the entire world to attain worldwide peace. 9. Why is Enlightenment Permanent? Gautama Buddha taught that all conditioned thoughts and feelings that arise are impermanent. He did not teach, everything is impermanent. What is a conditioned thought or feeling? 
A conditioned thought or feeling is an arisen thought or feeling that is dependent on an external source. For example, I am happy because I got a new car. The new car is the condition that is causing the happiness. The happiness has arisen in the mind due to the condition of the new car. But, since the new car is impermanent, the happiness experienced is impermanent. The thought or feeling of happiness that has arisen is impermanent. That is what is experienced in the unenlightened mind. The unenlightened mind craves, desires, attaches, has a mental longing with a strong eagerness for conditions to produce thoughts or feelings of happiness, for example. Then, the unenlightened mind attempts to hold on to these conditions, but when impermanence is experienced, the unenlightened mind then becomes sad, angered, or worse. This is not how an enlightened mind functions. An enlightened mind has been liberated from the constant craving, desire, attachment. The enlightened mind has eliminated craving, desire, attachment. All mental longing with a strong eagerness has ceased to exist. An enlightened mind will have been trained to extinguish the primary problem discovered by Gautama Buddha, which is craving, desire, attachment. Having eliminated the mind's mental longing with a strong eagerness, i.e. craving, desire, attachment, the mind no longer grasps, longs, or seeks fulfillment in external conditions. An enlightened mind knows that the conditioned thoughts and feelings are impermanent, i.e. temporary, and therefore has been trained not to seek fulfillment based on external conditions. An enlightened mind has removed, eliminated, eradicated, and extinguished all craving, desire, attachment, and therefore no longer has mental longing with a strong eagerness. The mind has been liberated, has attained nibbana, and is enlightened. The mental state of enlightenment is unshakable. Once a mind has been trained to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, it will not ever go back to seeking fulfillment from external conditions. The mind has acquired the wisdom that seeking fulfillment from an external condition only brings sadness, anger, or worse, and thus no longer has an interest or desire to seek fulfillment externally. Once one acquires this wisdom, the mind will not unlearn this wisdom, and thus it is permanent wisdom. The enlightened mind is permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, not based on any external conditions. All conditions have been removed, and thus the mind resides in the natural enlightened mental state that is permanent. One who has attained Nibbana will have a permanent mental state of joy. Having attained Nibbana, the joy experienced is without conditions and not based on an impermanent situation, object, or experience, and, therefore, is permanent. The unenlightened mind is affected by the impermanent nature of impermanent conditions. Gautama Buddha's teachings provide guidance to train the mind to attain a permanent place to reside unaffected by the impermanent nature of conditioned thoughts and feelings. This is the enlightened mind, completely pure and without conditioned thoughts or feelings. An enlightened mind is permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, not based on any conditions. All conditions are eliminated. An enlightened mind is liberated from the outward seeking and searching for satisfaction based on external conditions and is inwardly peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy that is permanent. 10. How do I become a Buddhist? Many times people ask, how do I become a Buddhist? This question often comes from the mind seeking a label or category for what one is choosing to become. In actuality, in my opinion, Gautama Buddha himself was not a Buddhist. The term Buddhist did not originate until after Gautama Buddha's death, so we know he was not a Buddhist. He discovered and shared teachings that lead to a better way of life, the awakened and enlightened mind. I do not think labels or categorizing people in any way is beneficial. We are all human beings. I see the question of, How do I become a Buddhist? As, how do I awaken the mind to enlightenment? Let me answer this question, how do I awaken the mind to enlightenment, which is more important than the previous question mentioned in the title of this question. 
To awaken the mind to enlightenment, a person needs to choose to learn and practice the teachings of Gautama Buddha to progress on the path to enlightenment with the guidance of a teacher. There is nothing formal one needs to do in order to learn and practice the teachings other than to have dedication and commitment to learning and practicing the teachings to awaken the mind to the enlightened mind, have access to the teachings, and access to a teacher. To awaken the mind, each practitioner will need a teacher. It is impossible to awaken the mind to enlightenment without the guidance of a teacher. A teacher will be able to provide you the teachings and personal guidance along the path to enlightenment. The only person who would be able to awaken the mind to the enlightened mind without teachers is a Buddha. The last Buddha currently known by the world existed over 2,500 years ago, so you and everyone else will need guidance from a teacher. Once you find a teacher, they should have resources to assist you in learning and practicing the teachings to independently acquire wisdom along the path. As you learn and practice the teachings, there is no aspect of the teachings from Gautama Buddha that is based on belief. Belief will not liberate the mind to awaken to the enlightened mind. A student will need to gradually learn and practice the teachings to independently observe the truth in the teachings to acquire wisdom. It is this newfound wisdom that will allow the mind to function through the enlightened wisdom one acquires. In this way, the mind can gradually progress towards attaining a permanent mental state that is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, the enlightened mind. Gautama Buddha did not share any teachings that include rites, rituals, or ceremonies. He taught that these things do not lead to enlightenment, so... There is no rite, ritual, or ceremony that is required in order to pursue the path to enlightenment. The enlightened mind will not experience any discontentedness. All discontent feelings will be eliminated 100% to include the elimination of sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears, boredom, loneliness, shyness, jealousy, resentment, etc. The mind will reside permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Are you on the path to enlightenment? Are you learning the teachings and progressing along the path? If not, you can be, and life is so much better as the mind gradually awakens to true reality, to enlightenment. 11. Why are donations of support for teachers of Gautama Buddha's teachings so important? There are two primary reasons why donations of support are important as it relates to Gautama Buddha's teachings. Let's explore those reasons. Continuation of Gautama Buddha's Teachings Gautama Buddha's teachings have only existed on this earth for over 2,500 years because people have offered support for their continued growth and expansion. There is no centralized organization responsible to collect and distribute Gautama Buddha's teachings and thus, It is up to individuals like you and me to continue the support and growth of these teachings worldwide. For over 2,500 years, people have provided food, water, clothing, shelter, medical supplies, and financial donations to support those who are sharing the teachings of Gautama Buddha. In this way, the teachers are able to focus their time on practicing the teachings to gain experience and on sharing the teachings of Gautama Buddha for the benefit of others. Teachers receive no inherent benefit for themselves in sharing the teachings, but what you will find is that people deeply practicing the teachings will oftentimes make the decision to share their experiences through formal teaching for your benefit. Legitimate teachers will openly and freely share the teachings with any and all beings, without reservation. They will accept any and all students who respectfully choose to learn and progress in their practice of these teachings. While they may freely offer the teachings for students to learn and progress, it is not free for teachers to offer the teachings. There are many resources needed to support a teacher's ability to exist in this life and share the teachings openly and freely. Teachers will set up their life in such a way that requires only basic support of food, water, clothing, shelter, medical supplies, and financial support. 
a dedicated teacher will not be interested in anything other than basic support and supplies to sustain their life. Without continuous donations to support teachers, the teachers would not be able to exist in the world to offer the teachings for practitioners to learn and progress on the path to enlightenment. The teachings would not have reached you in this life had countless people prior to you not offered donations of support so that teachers could continue to learn, practice, and offer the teachings openly and freely to all beings. It is the people before you that have provided regular donations of support to allow the teachings to continue and ultimately reach you for your benefit. It is your donation of support that will help you and people after you to learn and practice these teachings. Generosity leads to enlightenment. The primary problem that Gautama Buddha discovered in the mind is craving, desire, attachment. The unenlightened mind experiences discontent feelings because it holds on with a mental longing and strong eagerness. This is referred to as craving, desire, attachment. The mind causes itself to be discontent because with craving, desire, attachment, it holds on and therefore the mind experiences sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears, boredom, loneliness, shyness, jealousy, resentment, etc. To learn and progress in the practice of these teachings, a student can completely and entirely eliminate the discontent mind and all discontent feelings are eradicated to attain the enlightened mind. Craving, desire, attachment is the cause of the discontent mind and eliminating this unwholesome quality will eliminate discontent feelings from the mind. There are two remedies that Gautama Buddha shared to train the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. Breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity are the two practices Gautama Buddha shared to eliminate the unwholesome quality of craving, desire, attachment. Through practicing breathing mindfulness meditation with guidance of teachers and practicing generosity, the mind is trained to let go. Without practicing breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, among other teachings, a practitioner would not be able to attain enlightenment. Through practicing generosity, i.e. sharing, the mind is gradually trained to let go and practice selflessness. The mind has a tendency to hold on and accumulate things with selfish desires, but through sharing, the mind can be trained to recognize the interconnectivity of all beings through openly and freely sharing. Teachers who are openly and freely sharing these teachings are practicing generosity of their time, effort, energy, and resources with loving kindness and compassion for all beings. Gautama Buddha's teachings are designed to guide a practitioner in cultivating these qualities of mind so any legitimate teacher would openly and freely share the teachings with all beings without expectation of compensation or setting a price for sharing their teachings. But they will need and do accept donations of support to exist in the world and to offer the teachings. With that said, it is up to the students to regularly support their teachers. While a teacher is practicing generosity to openly and freely share the teachings with students, if the students are not also practicing generosity, there is not support for the teacher to continue their work to help students attain enlightenment. Essentially, if a teacher is openly and freely sharing with you, this tradition of teachings only works if students are also openly and freely sharing resources with their teacher on a regular basis. It is common for students to share food, water, clothing, shelter, medical supplies, and financial support along with time, effort, and energy to help their teacher to openly and freely share the teachings of Gautama Buddha. Without this generosity, a student would not be able to train the mind to practice non-craving, non-desire, or non-attachment. Therefore, a student would be unable to attain enlightenment. Without generosity, this tradition that leads to awakening of the mind, to liberation, to enlightenment, will not continue for the benefit of all beings to attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. 
While a legitimate teacher is not interested to openly request donations from their students, for a student who deeply understands these teachings and who are practicing these teachings to eliminate the discontent mind, they would freely make offerings of donations and supplies to help their teacher without a need for the teacher to request support. Students will need to openly, freely, and continually make offerings to their teachers to support the continuation of the teachings, to train their mind to let go, and to make progress on the path to enlightenment. The entire Buddhist tradition and the teachings Gautama Buddha shared with the world is based on loving-kindness, compassion, and generosity of all beings. The foundation and continuation of this tradition is based on teachers openly and freely sharing the teachings with loving-kindness, compassion, and generosity. And the foundation and continuation of this tradition is based on students making offerings with loving-kindness, compassion, and generosity. Cultivating loving-kindness, compassion, and generosity throughout humanity is highly beneficial for all beings to create a kinder, more peaceful, and loving society. If we enjoy and expect teachers not to set a price to offer and share Gautama Buddha's teachings, then students need to take the initiative to openly and freely make offerings to support the teachers and the teachings they share for the benefit of all beings. Support our efforts to share the teachings of Gautama Buddha with you and worldwide for all people. Patreon Patreon.com forward slash support Buddha PayPal paypal.me forward slash support Buddha 999 How to Determine If You Have Attained Nibbana 1. Never Stop Practicing the Teachings Nibbana, or the pursuit of Nibbana, is exactly that, a pursuit. Even when you feel Nibbana has been attained, you should never feel you are done and stop practicing the teachings. To attain Nibbana, you will need a well-established understanding and practice of these teachings. If you have developed a solid practice of these teachings and see the benefits, you will not be interested to stop practicing. Even when you experience what you feel is Nibbana, you need to never consider yourself as having attained Nibbana. Continue to practice the teachings, always pursuing deeper and deeper wisdom through your well-developed learning and practice of these teachings. 2. You will be fully practicing the Eightfold Path, which includes the Four Noble Truths and the Five Precepts. See previous chapters for details on these teachings and practices. 3. When you have fully attained Nibbana as an Arahant, you will have eliminated all the Ten Fetters. See previous chapters for details on these teachings and practices. 4. You have cultivated a mind that is completely practicing the Brahma Viharas. See previous chapters for details on these teachings and practices. 5. You will be fully practicing the seven factors of Nibbana. See previous chapters for details on these teachings and practices. 6. You will know for yourself you have attained Nibbana because you will have eliminated 100% of discontentedness from the mind. This means you will no longer experience any of these feelings. A painful feeling, sadness, depression, anger, hatred, ill will, guilt, shame, fear, anxiety, stress, etc. A pleasant feeling, happiness, excitement, elation, etc. A feeling that is neither painful nor pleasant, Boredom, loneliness, melancholy, shyness, displeased, uncomfortable, unsatisfied, etc. In the unenlightened state, you will experience painful feelings, pleasant feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. These are the feelings Gautama Buddha's teachings guide you to eliminate from the mind. They are all in permanent mental states and completely eliminated for one who has attained Nibbana. Nibbana is a permanent mental state that is unaffected by these impermanent feelings and is a permanent place for the mind to reside. The mind will be protected, unshakable, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. 
the body and the mind will feel light and completely at peace. To understand more about what is Nibbana, see Chapter 3. Additional Notes It is important to pursue Nibbana without craving or desire to attain it, but use it as a goal, an interest, or an objective. If there is craving, even craving for Nibbana, you will not be able to attain full Nibbana as an Arahant. And, if there is craving at the time of death, there will be rebirth. You should not and will not compare or profess to another person which stage of Nibbana you feel you have attained. You should never believe you have attained Nibbana and constantly pursue this path your entire life. Should you ever feel you have attained Nibbana and are done, the mind will become sluggish and halt your progress on this path. If the mind is sluggish, you are not practicing the seven factors of Nibbana and thus have not attained Nibbana. If you profess your stage of Nibbana to others, then you do so with ego and therefore it is well known that you have not attained Nibbana. The four stages of Nibbana are provided as a personal guide to assist you on the path to higher and higher degrees of attainment, but never to be compared to others or feel that you are more important than another person. If you feel this way, you have not attained Nibbana. The end of each chapter will have learning resources for further exploration. You will be able to explore videos, podcasts, quizzes, etc. to deepen your learning of the content you read in each chapter. Please see the ebook for more details on these resources. As you have questions or need clarification on these teachings, you are welcome to post those into the Facebook group Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, or contact the author privately for in-depth learning. Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Daily Wisdom 999. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.